21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. Armed robbery in the 24th. Well, we don't know much about it here. We got the car, that's all. It was parked over there on 2nd Avenue. It was in the alarms. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Yeah. We'll hold them here. Yeah. We got them. Okay. Yeah. Twenty first precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the one hundred and seventy three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. Before midnight, things were quiet in the precinct, and I had the opportunity to remain in my office and clean up much of the paperwork that had accumulated. After I turned out the 12 to 8 platoon at midnight, I instructed Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, to have a car come by the house to take me on patrol of the precinct. In compliance, the Communications Bureau was requested to put out a radio call for sector car number 3, which on receiving the broadcast, stopped at the nearest police call box. The car's recorder, Patrolman Vaccaro, was instructed to take over a foot patrol post, and the operator, Patrolman Farrell, drove the car to the station house to pick me up. During the course of my patrol, we first toured the northern end of the precinct, and then, on my instructions, Patrolman Farrell headed the car downtown. At 12.50 a.m., we were driving south on 2nd Avenue in the 80s. As we slowed down to stop for a signal, I saw a man concealing himself in the doorway of a closed bakery. At a glance, the man appeared to be a policeman. I told Patrolman Farrell to pull into the curb. All right, come on. Yes, sir. It is a policeman. Who is it? Meister? Yes, sir, Meister. What are you doing in there? See that Ford parked down there, Captain? Yeah? What do you say, Meister? Oh, hi, Carl. Well, what about the car? I saw it in the alarms before the turnout, Captain. It's wanted in connection with the armed robbery of a liquor store up on Upper Broadway. When was this? In the evening before midnight sometime, Captain. I didn't make a particular note of the exact time, only the description of the car. Farrell. Yes, sir. Take your car and pull it around the next corner there. Okay, Captain. And wait there. Yes. Did you ring in with it, Meister? Yes, I did, Captain. The lieutenant said stay here and keep my eyes on it. He's notifying the detectives. What did the alarm say? Did you get the registration numbers? No, only the last two numbers, Captain. Eight O. Oh. It said a 1950 or 51 Ford two-door black, right rear fender dented and taillight smashed. Oh, well, that fits all right. Yes, sir. When I spotted the car, I felt the hood. The motor was still warm. Anything inside of it? No, the doors were locked, Captain. I put my light in it, and I didn't see anything. Did Lieutenant Gorman say the detectives were on their way? And he said just to wait here for them, sir. Okay. Good work, Master. Thank you, Captain. We, uh, we better stay back in the door. Yes. You, uh, don't know anything more about this robbery what time it was or where. No, sir. I read that alarm along with the others that were on the board and put the description in my book. I think it was uptown on Broadway, a liquor store, and that's, that's the only thing I recall for sure. Uh-huh. Couldn't have happened too much before midnight because it was the latest alarm on the board. Oh, it... There's a man coming to the car, I think. No, I don't think so, Captain. Looks like he's going to cross the street. Yeah. He's going to get in on the driver's side. Come on. Yes, sir. Right with you. I'm looking for his key. You take this side. I'll go around. Okay, sir. Wait a minute, mister. Me? Yeah, you. Just stay out of the car. Now, what's the matter? Okay, Captain? Come here, Meister. Yes, sir. You're the owner of this car? Uh, sure. What's the trouble? What's with the gun? Get away from that pocket. 
Wait a minute. Don't get touchy. I was just going to show you my registration. Lean up against the car there. Put your hands on the top of it. Look, Cap, I don't know what this is all about. I'll tell you what it's all about. This car is suspected in an armed robbery. Now lean up against there and make it snappy. All right, I will. Don't get excited. Okay, Master. Yes, sir. I hate to say it, but you guys got the wrong office someplace. Well, he's clean, Captain. So where'd you expect me to be? Look in the car, in the glove compartment. Yes, sir. All right, move over, mister. There's nothing in there. We'll see about that. I'm telling you, you got the wrong office, Cap. There's nothing, Captain. What's your name? McLeese. Joe McLeese. You have the registration for this car? Yeah. And your operator's license? Yeah, sure. All right, let's see him. I uh, got to go into my pocket to get him. Go ahead. All right, I just wanted to make sure. What have you been doing tonight, Joe? Nothing. What was I supposed to have been doing? Where were you? I was having a few drinks. Here, here's the registration. Take it, Meister. Yes, sir. And here's my driver's license. Okay. Now, listen, what's the deal? Let me ask the questions. Where are you coming from? Right just now, you mean? Yeah. I was over at the pub there, Jeremy's. Where's that? Down there, two blocks down, second Avenue. How come you parked up here? Because when I parked the car, it was early. There wasn't any place near to park. What's your birthday, Joe? June 4th. What year? 1919, like it says on there. Well, these things check out, Captain. Yeah. Put them back in your pocket, Joe. Yeah. Can I take this one, too? What time did you park here? I don't know. 9 o'clock, 9.30, something like that. You sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. That's when you went to the bar? Yeah. And you've been there since? Sure, I've been there since. Go ask Jerry. Ask anybody in there. You didn't leave at all? Well, I went out for a few minutes to get a little air, you know. All that smoke in there could get your eyes if you don't get some air. The detectives are here, Captain. Oh, it's the looker. What do you need detectives for? You got him, Captain? Yeah. Got me for what? What do you say, Meister? Uh, this is the car, Lud. What car? And this is the guy. Say, if you're a detective, solve me a mystery, will you? What's this all about? Come on, Lud, I, uh... I'll show you the back of the car. Okay, Captain. What's this all about? That's what I like to know. We'll find out in good time. Well, this uh, looks like the car, all right. Well, that's why I took some time getting over here. I rang up to the 24th to get some more information than what was on the alarm. What time was this robbery? About 10.25. This fellow claims he's been in a bar since 9.30. Was this stick-up man all alone? That's what the witnesses say, Captain. Fellow double parked on Broadway up there. Went into the liquor store and boosted the clerk. The clerk started out the door after him. The man took a couple of shots, hit him in the arm, and ran to the car. I got plenty of witnesses that saw both the car and the man. Now, this one here, he's, uh, says he's been in the bar from 9.30 on. That's what he says, yeah. But Meister felt the hood when he spotted the car. It was still warm. Well, let's find out what it's all about, huh? Eh? Right. Nobody's asking you to take my word for it. All right, Joe, tell it to the detectives, will you? I'm asking you, just go in the bar and ask Jerry, that's all. Ask any of the guys in there. They'll tell you I was sitting at the bar there. They'll even tell you the flavor of the beer I was drinking. Ever been arrested, Joe? What's that got to do with now? When was the last time you were arrested? Last time I wasn't arrested. They had me in because they wanted to talk to me about something. Oh, uh, who was that? Downtown, down Ninth Street. What do they want to talk to you about? Who knows? Who knows what they want to talk to you about? Somebody did something. When was this? Like around Christmas. Ever do any time, Joe? Sure, I did some time. There's no secret about that. For what? It was what they call grand larceny. That's got nothing to do with this. What are you going to do? Hold it against me every little thing because I did a bit once? It don't mean I was into this thing. No, it doesn't, Joe, but uh, you got to admit it sure drops the odds. The suspect and his automobile were taken to the station house, and I walked around the corner where Patrolman Farrell was waiting in sector car number three, to continue on patrol of the precinct. At the station house, Patrolman Meister took the suspect upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad office to await arrival of detectives from the 24th precinct in which the armed robbery had occurred. In the meantime, Detective DeLuca drove to the bar and grill where Joe McLeese said he spent the entire evening. It was now nearly 1.30 in the morning and business had tapered off. As DeLuca walked into the place, there was only one patron at the bar. Down at the far end, the bartender had a morning tabloid spread open to the sports page. What do you say? Hi. I'm a detective. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought you looked familiar. Hmm? You came over here and talked to me a couple of months ago. 
some guy claimed he got rolled by a babe in here? Yeah, that's right. Hey, what happened to that guy? Did he ever get his money back? Well, he was married, and he didn't want to want to press it too hard. Got weak in the knees as soon as he thought he might have to appear in court. He should have thrown it up before he picked up this dish. Yeah, that's right. I ain't seen her around here anymore. What's your name again? DeLuca. Oh, yeah, DeLuca. Uh, how about something? No, 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 thanks. Look, uh, you know a fella called Joe McLeese? Joe McLeese. Yeah. Jerry. Yeah, all right. Uh, excuse me, uh, business before play. Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Same? Yeah. He's a fellow about my height, about 35 years old. He's got a little bit of a little mustache. Oh, yeah, Joe McLeese. Sure, I know him. He was in here tonight. Oh, yeah? What time did he come in? Let's see. Uh, what's the matter with him? You getting a jam? No, we're just checking up on something. Oh, well, let's see. I, I had the basketball game on. It goes on about 9.30. I think it was in... I think he was in here when it began, yeah. Mm-hmm. He was having a discussion with Quinny about the starting lineups. When he was saying the Knicks would be better off if they started so and so, Joe didn't think so. How long did he stay? Oh, he stood through the whole game at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had a couple of bets going on between them, Joe and Quinney and one or two of the other guys. He didn't move. What time was the game over? Well, let's see. It was after eleven o'clock. Yeah, you know, a couple of minutes after, because when the game was over, one of the fellows would switch over to the eleven o'clock news and let's see what the Russians are doing. I switched over, and the news was already on a couple of minutes. Yeah. What time did he finally leave, Jerry? Oh, some babe came in here. She oh. took him over to the booth, and they sat down and talked a minute. He left with her, and he came back a while later. Came back alone. What time did she come in? Oh, I couldn't say exactly. Uh, 11.30, like. Oh. How long was he gone? Oh, a half hour, maybe. You, you know, know this? This? You know this girl? Well, yeah, she comes in here once in a while. What's her name? Uh, Ellie something. Uh, Ellie what? That's on the tip of my tongue. Ellie, Ellie. Uh, Ellie Kurt, yeah. Ellie Kurt. Good night, Jerry. Uh, take it easy. Look, uh, you know where she lives? Yeah, I think so. I, I cashed a paycheck for her once, and the bank sent it back. She didn't endorse it like it was made out exactly. I had to go over there and get her to endorse it again. I don't remember the number, but you walk around a corner, and it's in the building with the shoemaker there. She lives upstairs. Okay, Jerry, thanks. Listen, uh, Mr. DeLuca, uh, I don't want to be I want to be everybody's friend. I hope Joe isn't doing any jam. I don't like to make any trouble. Well, look, just don't worry about it. If he's got trouble, he... He made it for himself. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Before leaving the bar, Detective DeLuca telephoned the 21st squad and spoke to Lieutenant Matt King, his immediate superior. After relaying the information he had obtained, he was instructed to walk around the corner and attempt to locate the woman, Ellie Kurt, to see what light she could shed on the case. In the meantime, I was still out on patrol in sector car number three with patrolman Farrell as operator. At 1.50 a.m., we had left the precinct and driven to the 22nd precinct, which is on the 86th Street Transverse in Central Park, in order to fill the car with gasoline and have the oil checked. As patrolman Farrell was signing the MT-9 receipt for the gasoline, I sat in the car. My attention was suddenly brought to the radio speaker when I heard the CB dispatcher put out a call for car 681, which is the departmental number for sector car number 2 of the 21st. The recorder in car 681 responded and gave his location at 73rd Street and York Avenue. CB then instructed 681 to make a run. A police officer shot, ambulance responding. I tapped on the horn as a signal for patrolman Farrell. He hurried to the car, and we rolled on the call, proceeding out of the park, across 84th Street, and down 2nd Avenue with the siren wide open. In dispatching men to the scene of a serious crime or an emergency, specific instructions are given by the Communications Bureau to only one car. In addition, however, the sergeant's car and all other departmental vehicles within a radius of five blocks must respond irrespective of sector, precinct, or division boundary lines. When we neared the scene, I could see that there were already four cars on the job. Sector cars one and two from the 21st, the car from the traffic precinct C, and the sergeant's car. 
All right, give him a hand on the sidewalk here, pal. Yes, sir. Come on. Sergeant. Sergeant Waters. Hello, Captain. What is it? Who shot? It's not a policeman, Captain. Oh? The Lucas sent a civilian to call in. He got it a little mixed up. Well, who is shot? All right, Coley. Keep the sidewalk clean here, will you? Get them away from that door. The Luca went up to talk to some woman here. Guy inside the apartment started shooting at him. Uh, second floor, Captain. Well, is the man shot? Yeah, Captain. He looks dead. All right. Hold him. Get those people back inside their flats, will you? Okay, sir. Okay. Did anyone notify the desk officer and CB that it wasn't a police officer shot? Yes, sir. That's where I've been. I just rang in. What about the ambulance? Found away, Captain. The detectives? Well, the Lucas here. Uh, in the front there, Captain. And Lieutenant King. Uh, get those people away from the door, huh? All right, all right. Okay, Captain. Come on, move on. All right, Captain. Yeah. He looks like he's had it. Yes, sir, but he almost gave it to me first. Yeah? Where's Lieutenant King? He's in the bedroom there talking to the woman, Ellie Kurt. What happened, Lud? Well, it was on a chain deal with the car Meister spotted. I was checking out this Joe's story, so I went to the bar and grill. Bartender bore him out almost 100%. The only thing is, he told me a woman came into the place about 11.30 and Joe left with her. And he came back alone about a half hour later. The woman was Miss Ellie Kurt. She lives here. Yeah, well, I walked on over here and came upstairs to talk to her. I knocked on the door, and I could hear some whispering going on inside, so so I was set. She opened up the door and let me in, and I started to talk to her about Joe. And this here fella came out of the kitchen. He had an old 32-nickel-plated Spanish make in his hand and started after me. Oh, you see in the wall there, there are two of the shots. Yeah. yeah but I was ready for him, though. Well, you didn't hit any wall, Lud. No, sir. How about that ambulance, Sergeant? Down away, Captain. I don't think the ambulance is going to do him any good, sir. He, uh, looks about right for that stick-up, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's the guy, all right, Captain. And what does this Ellie have to say? I didn't get much of a chance to talk to her. She was pretty hysterical until Lieutenant King started to talk to her. I had a tough time keeping her quiet. Mm -hmm. How'd the call get mixed up? It came over police officer shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. A neighbor down the hall came out, and I told him I was a police officer, and there had been a shooting, and for him to call the police. Well, he was a bit excited, and his English wasn't too good, so he got the whole thing upside down. Yeah. Well, I go on in here. Mm. What can Matt? I do? Come in, Captain. I didn't know anything about him. I'm sure I know anything about him. You certainly know about him tonight. I it? found out about him tonight, but what can I do? I couldn't do anything. Captain, this is Ellie Kirk. Hello? I, I didn't know Duck was going to shoot at the cop. He didn't tell me anything about that. He just told me to say he wasn't here. That's all. Just say he wasn't here. <laughs> Listen, is he dead? Yes, we think so. Well, don't you know? We're waiting for the ambulance surgeon. It's up to him to say so. Oh. He, he really was not a bad fellow. I didn't think he was very bad till tonight. All right, now what happened? Well, he was here and there was somebody knocking at the door. I don't mean start there. I mean start earlier tonight. Oh. From the time Dunk got here. Well, you see, we've had this date. He was supposed to be here at 9 o'clock. We were going to go downtown and have some pizza and beer. You know, that's what he told me we were going to do. What time did he show up? Well, it wasn't until about 11 o'clock, and boy, I was mad. I almost didn't let him in. He told me it wasn't his fault. He couldn't help it and everything like that. Stood out there knocking on the door, and I said, if you're two hours late, you might as well not come at all if that's as reliable as you can be. I was really sore. But you let him in. Well, he begged me to open up. He said he couldn't help being late because he was in a jam, a real jam. The way he was talking, I could see he wasn't lying about that, so I let him in. Mm. What did you tell him? Well, he said he borrowed this car from a friend of his, a fellow named Joe something, McQueese. Did you know him, Joe? Oh, yeah, I met him. I met him a couple of times. Anyway, Dunk said he borrowed Joe's car tonight, and he got in some trouble, and I asked him if he had a wreck. He said, no, it wasn't anything like that. And he told me to go down to the bar there, to Jeremy's, you know, the place that's around there on 2nd Avenue? Yeah, we know. And he asked me to go down there and find Joe and tell him to come up here to the house. Well, I said, okay, but what's it all about? And Dunk told me what I don't know wouldn't hurt me. Just go find Joe. What time was that? 
Oh, I don't know. It was about 11.30 or something like that. You went down to the bar? Yeah. Did you find Joe? Yeah, he was sitting there. I told him Dunk was at my house and wanted to see him. And right away, Joe thought Dunk wrecked the car. I said, no, it wasn't anything like that, but he was in a jam. So we come back here together, Joe and me. Uh, what did Dunk tell Joe? Well, first, Dunk told me to get in the bedroom so they could talk. And I said, listen, whose house is this anyway? But Dunk said he had something private to talk over to Joe. And so I came on in here. But you heard what they were talking about? Yeah, after it started to get loud. What were they talking about? Well, you see, Dunk had told Joe he wanted to borrow the car to go pick up a vacuum cleaner or something like that he bought for his mother. And Joe lent him the car if he'd fill it up with gas. Anyway, Dunk told Joe instead of picking up the vacuum cleaner, he used the car in a stick-up and there was some shooting and all that. Did you hear where the stick-up was? No, I didn't, but I'm telling you, my heart sank right down to the floor. I didn't know Dunk was mixed up in anything like that. You know, I didn't think he was no perfect angel, but I had no idea there was anything like stick-ups with him. Well, what did Joe have to say? Well, I'm telling you, he was plenty burned up. He was really mad at Dunk for taking the car under false pretenses like that and putting a lot of heat on it. He was, he was steaming. Then why did Dunk tell him anything? Why didn't he just return the car? Well, to tell you the truth, he was a little bit worried that someone saw the car and got the license numbers and all that. So, so he, he told Joe if anyone came asking any questions for Joe not to say anything about Dunk borrowing the car. Mm. What did Joe say to that? Well, he told Dunk he was out of his mind. Well, I can see his reasoning. Then Dunk said he didn't think anyone saw the license number, but he just wanted to make sure, and Joe said he was crazy. If the cops came in, what was he going to tell them? Well, how'd they settle it? Oh, they settled it all right. How? Well, they were arguing back and forth, and finally Joe says to Dunk, how much did you get? And Dunk says, how much did I get and what? And from the boosting, Joe says, so Dunk told him $180. So Joe says, all right, give me half, I won't say anything. Well, Dunk didn't want to go for that, but in the end he did, he gave him half. You overheard all of this? Well, they were screaming so loud I couldn't help it. I couldn't sit in here and twirl my thumbs, could I? Then Joe left. Yeah. Where'd he go? I don't know. He just left. Dunk gave him back the keys to the car and he just left. Did you say anything to Dunk about what you heard? Are you kidding? You think I wanted to get involved in something like a stick up on me? Dunk stayed here. Yeah. I wanted to go out and get the pizza like you promised, but he just wanted to sit around. The whole thing was bothering him. A stick up? Oh, no. Give him the half to Joe, I think. Well, what happened when the detective knocked on the door? Well, Dunk said, ask who it is. And I asked, and the detective said it was a detective. So Dunk says, don't say anything about him being here. And he went out in the kitchen. So I let the detective in, and he started asking a lot of questions. And I wasn't going to lie to him, and Dunk must have heard this. So he comes out with that gun, and believe me, I was scared. I was scared to death. I knew somebody was going to get killed. Oh, the way these things can wind up? Somebody getting killed? You know it, and I was afraid it was going to be me. Within a few minutes, an ambulance from Metropolitan Hospital arrived at the scene, and the ambulance surgeon pronounced Dunk Sipton DOA. Pursuant to the manual of procedure, the medical examiner was notified. So were the homicide squad and the district attorney's office. It is not the province of the police department to pass judgment only to investigate and present the facts. The death of a human being at the hands of another is always homicide. And it's up to other authorities to say whether a homicide is justifiable, excusable, or felonious. It was not until after 3 o'clock that I was able to return to the station house. I walked around the desk to sign the blotter. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, told me that detectives of the 24th squad had arrived at the station house to talk to Joe McLeese. When they came into the muster room, he informed them of the shooting, and they drove directly to the scene. Patrolman Meister was still upstairs in the 21st squad office with his prisoner, and I went up to talk to him. All the detectives on duty were out on the job. Patrolman Meister and Joe were alone in the room. Hello, Captain. Meister. Listen, how long are you going to keep me sitting here? All right, Joe. All right. Well, look, I got some rights. We all got rights. Come here, Meister. Yes, sir. I'm entitled to an answer, don't you think? Stay on that bench. You'll get your answer later. You've been telling me that for hours. Yes, sir. Does he know about his friend and DeLuca? Joe's friend? Yeah. Well, no, sir, I don't guess so. I've been sitting with him. Nobody said anything to me or to him. You saw the detectives go out of here, didn't you? 
So yesterday, they went out on a shooting over... Does that have some connection with this, Captain? It sure does. Hello, Captain. Matt? Well, we're all cleaned up over there, Captain. You bring the girl in? Still okay. Good work, Meister. Well, yes, thank you, sir. Let's talk to him, Captain. Yeah. Hello, Joe. You still here? Not because I want to be. Look, Captain, I was in that bar all night. I don't know anything about any stick-up. You know how many cars there are like mine? There must be 10,000 in the city of New York. Yeah, maybe there are. I'd hate to have to count them, I'll tell you that. What do you say? Let's call it a night, huh? Up to now, I didn't mind it because I want to help you out if I can, but fair is fair. I don't know anything about what you want to know. Now, Joe, that's a great big lie, isn't it? Why should I lie to you? I got nothing to lie about. You know where I was, Captain Pelham. Yes, I know where you were, Joe. So that settles it. And I know where you're going to be, too. Where? Well, when you're down there and the judge says 10 years, ask him for half. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. A shooting? Where? At the museum or near the museum? Who's doing the shooting? Well, are the police officers there? Now, where is it exactly? Not and exactly. so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Eileen Palmer, John Larkin, Frank Moss, John Sylvester, and Frank Campanella. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Art Hannah speaking. <laughs>